Good afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary in New York. Thank you all for joining me this afternoon in a conversation regarding the meaning and role of the church as this nation reckons with the realities of racial injustice and how to make real the affirmation that Black lives matter. I am very honored this afternoon to have joining me in this conversation, my bishop and my friend, the Right Reverend Marianne Ugger Edgar Buddy, who is Bishop for the Diocese of Washington, DC. Welcome, Marianne, and thank, thank you. you so much for taking time to join me in this conversation. Great to be with you, Kelly. Let's jump right in, because we have much to cover in a short span of time. Marianne, in many conversations that you and I have had over time, you have expressed how important it is for the church to show up, indeed for faith leaders to show up. And as we look out at what's going on today in our nation, and we see many wide sectors of our country showing up and diverse voices showing up in this moment that we hope is more than a moment of Black Lives Matters protests. Right. So I wanna begin by asking you, what was it that compelled you to show up in such a bold way a couple of weeks ago when the president made his infamous, may we say, appearance at St. John's Episcopal Church? Kelly, I would say it was one of those moments when I felt summoned and both internally, but equally important externally. Because as you and I have spoken, um, I wasn't at St. John's. I was at home watching the news with my mother and it, the news wasn't even covering that particular incident, but my phone just started lighting up with people from across the church, um, texting me, uh, leaving me messages, calling me to alert me to what was happening. And um, like I'm sure many people, I couldn't quite grasp mm -hmm. what I was now seeing on my phone as people were sending me images and trying to imagine a response. So I called a few people who had touched base with me. I was trying to process internally. And one of my trusted uh, colleagues said, this is the moment, Marianne, you need to talk now. And I had this sense that the sun could not go down with that being the definitive image of, 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 the, of, that, of that tableau, the president holding a Bible in front of St. John's Church, that there needed to be a response and that by position, it was mine to make. So I... I was as close to on autopilot as I've ever been in my life in that I wasn't necessarily thinking through each thing, but simply taking the next step as it was presented to me. That makes sense. You know, sometimes you just feel like there's, you just catapulted out into the arena and, and that's what it was like. Sort of the urgency uh, compelled you. And I think those of us who uh, heard you, particularly as you were on CNN, you could feel the uh, passion and the urgency uh, in, in your response and in your voice. And one of the things that seemed that really struck you was the fact that one of our sacred symbols, right, was it perhaps more than one, uh, the church and the Bible was indeed being abused. How, how do we reclaim our symbols when they are being abused? We saw that in an obvious way, right, a couple of weeks ago, but we know that in other less obvious ways, and, uh, our sim sacred symbols are being manipulated and abused in such a way that they began to legitimate acts of injustice and other things. So how do we begin to reclaim these symbols? Um. It's, that's a, that's a question to answer on several levels, Kelly, it seems to me, and I don't know that I have the complete answer. Um, in that moment, what I felt was the urgency publicly to disassociate our church 
from, and you know, obviously when we speak of the church, there are many churches and there are many expressions of church and there are many faces and embodiment of church, but that the church for which I am responsible and you, to, to which you and I belong, I, I felt like I had to publicly disassociate the president holding the Bible in front of the church after having cleared the park, after having publicly uh, declared that he would um, use force if needed, a, a military force against American civilians. And indeed, uh, many of the things that the president has stood for that I believe I personally believe is are antithetical to the gospel. So that was a public, it was more a sense of, this was not going to have the final word on my watch. So I would say that there's a public responsibility. The personal responsibility or the communal responsibility is a much more, um, it's not in front of cameras. Yep. It's more in how we ourselves are mindful of the power of those, not only of those symbols, but what the symbols mean to, seek to, to allow us to enter, which are the deepest mysteries of life and faith. And so we can't just simply be outraged at another person's misappropriation. We have to be about the work of living deeply into what those texts and places and sacred moments point us toward, which are, you know, coming into the presence of God whenever we are blessed to have that sense of experience and then living in such a way that our body, that our bodies, our lives are in some poor way, but the best that we're able to reflect what, what the texts uh, teach us, what the spirit of Jesus um, embodies in human form, and when we build buildings, uh, what they are meant to house. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it's, it's, it's deeper yeah. work than... Yeah, no, it's it's deeper I'm work. It, it, I, I just, I feel like it's both, you know, we, we have to, we have to walk the talk that we proclaim and we have to be more than against something. We actually have to be for something. No, very, yeah. And that's what I hear you saying that it's not only sort of the protest and the public uh, uh, protest and the witnessing against, but it's also the witnessing for, and that has to happen on a consistent basis that is not necessarily that bold public claim and, and live into on a, a daily basis, the realities of what it means to be church. And perhaps we'll get back to that. I mean, I wanna follow up a little bit on the public showing up, right? Yeah. Uh, to, uh, because a couple of days or so after uh, that photo op, uh, you, along with other clergy uh, within the Episcopal Church and perhaps uh, other faith traditions, went down to join uh, the protest on 16th Street uh, in front of St. John's Church, which has now become Black Lives Matters Plaza. Uh, right. uh, but when you went down there, the Black Lives Matter protesters and others uh, that were there weren't quite as welcoming because they felt that now the movement was in some ways being co-opted uh, by the faith community uh, and that the attention was being taken away from the issue at hand and that is uh, racial injustice and that black lives matters. You spoke with some of those uh, protesters uh, individually. What, what did you learn from that uh, what did you hear? What did you learn about what it means to show up, how you show up, and especially the, the white church, how it shows up in times like that? Um, first of all, thank you for the question. And it, uh, I consider it one of the most important experiences of the week for me. Uh, there was a real groundswell of interest among our interfaith and ecumenical partners in the city to have some kind of gathering at St. John's. And let me back up by saying that before the president uh, crossed the street that night, since the protests started happening um, at outside of Lafayette, around Lafayette uh, Square, St. John's was offering a ministry of hospitality. And we as a diocese had committed to simply being present for prayer and water and support for as long as the protests lasted. So that was prior to that. And that wasn't something we were going to continue, even after the building had been vandalized twice. And I say that and neither one were serious, but we were trying to like not let that be the attention and focus back on, on the protest and its message. So when our faith partners wanted to gather again, um, we said, okay, we'll, we'll do that. We'll pray with you as long as we keep our focus outward. 
But when we, what we discovered that morning was that the periphery of security had been um, widened so that we no longer had access to the plaza. And so the decision was made to have the, the vigil prayer service right as close as we could get. That may have been a mistake. And the reason, it, I, the reason I think it might have been a miscalculation on our part is because there was already a protest there or a, a presence there of mostly young people who had been there all morning. They'd been there all morning, sitting right there on the street. And because there was so much media attention to us coming down, um, which I suspect we wanted, right? We wanted some of that to kind of cast a, you know, a wider message. Um, but what happened was that there was an, in the effort to create a platform for us to speak and have our vigil, uh, the cameras and the microphones basically displaced right. all of these young people or sort of squeezed in among them. And of course, a lot of people from our various traditions also showed up. So it wasn't just the 12 of us or so who were there to, to express solidarity and to pray, but there were all these other people crowding into a space where the young people already were. And so when we got up to speak, all I could see were the microphones and the cameras. I couldn't see any people. Wow. And it was awful. It was just awful. And my poor colleague, Rob Fisher, had tried to say something beforehand. And it was just a, nobody heard him. And, and then I just, and then I heard one of the young people saying, sit down. And I thought, I don't want to talk to the cameras. So I walked over and I sat down. And what I encountered was a lot of anger, a lot of, ang of anger from several of the people, the younger people who were right up in front. I don't know what they, they had roles or not, but they were just right there. And they were arguing among themselves as well, but they were talking very heatedly about the fact that they had been there all day, that nobody had been listening to them. And that then we came and all the cameras shifted to us. And I felt terrible. I felt like I had done the exact opposite. I had contributed to the exact opposite of what I'd hoped for, right? It was just, an, I, and I, I was completely silenced. I couldn't think of a thing to say. And then one of my Baptist colleagues who had no fear whatsoever, just came right to my side, started speaking to these young people with the authority of his great booming voice about unity and how we, how the, how the, <laughs> how people wanted to divide us, but we were all, and they were all listening to him. And I felt so grateful. And then he said, now the, now the good bishop wants to say something to you. And I thought, no, I really don't. I just, but I apologized. And then we sat down and we talked some more. And I'm not going to say we all kissed and made up, but at least it was a gentler, it was so what, a gentler what, what, moment. What and I just about? felt like, I just felt like here, here was a learning of like, there, there was the power in that moment. And I don't have it all the time, but every once in a while you're given the power of the microphone of the press following you, right? And it followed us and we weren't the story. Now, can I continue for just a moment? Yes. yes. I didn't realize that another, this is just my naivete about these things and I have so much to learn, but the same Baptist minister who's, I can't remember his name because I'd never met him before. He was from uh, an assembly of leaders that had come into town for this, for a convention or something. He said, sister, are they keeping you from your church? And I said, yeah. The, the, and he said, do you want to cross, do you want to cross over to you? Because if you want to cross sister, I am right there with you. And I'm like, no, I really do not want to cross. And I was thinking again, I don't want this to be about us. And everything. But I didn't realize that behind all of that, was the outrage that there were federal troops keeping us from the church, right? And then Mayor wow. Bowser was on her way, right? Because she wanted to join with her because her interfaith council was also coming down there. And I realized afterwards that the bigger issue there was federal troops on city property, right? That they had expanded the perimeter and that's where she was making her stand, right? And I thought, okay, there's, there's a lot going on in this little... <laughs> <laughs> in this little space, right? So we had a prayer with the mayor right there. And I just saw her eyes. I mean, she was, I just thought this is a woman on fire. And so, and then you know what happened the next day. But um, so I, I, to answer your question, I learned that sometimes even with the best of intentions, you can make really significant errors. Um, that it's always good to acknowledge it and to, to listen to the people who are, um, who are, who are there. 
Um, I also recognized the chasm between the church and these young people. They didn't know who we were. They didn't care, you know? Yep. And I thought, okay, this is, this is my reality. What can I do? Um, Cause on, on some level, they didn't really care what I had to say. Right. And what um, did that tell us about the way the church has or has not shown up? Shown up? Not simply in, cause here's the church right in their right. eyes coming into this moment. But what they have not recognized is the church in those times where there's not that moment, right? And so what does that, I often say, this, all of this, the reality that black lives have not mattered and the racial injustice, et cetera, white supremacies flourishing has happened on our watch as church and they could see it. So what, what, what does that tell us about the reality of, of the church? Well, as I said earlier, um, church is a big word, and I, I, can't, I can't claim the mantle for all of the church, but for my corner of it, and certainly my role in it, it means that it's very easy to, um, to be um, ignorant of the things that are in fact happening to people who are not in our immediate circles of concern or relationship. And so if that's not, if, if your or my circle of concern or relationship does not include people who are impacted daily by the realities that are, are happening in our criminal justice system in, in, in encounters with the police, just to talk about these two things, um, that means that we're not gonna see it. I'm not gonna see it. And therefore I will be, I will be focused on other things while this is happening. Um, and I can genuinely say I was not aware, um, and there's truth in that, but that doesn't mean that I'm exonerated from the reality that's occurring, as you said, on my watch, um, in my lifetime, in my, in my, if you will, my tenure as a leader of the church. And so where, where we show up and where we choose to put our energies is so important because that will determine what we see. And what we see will be determined what we, we see of God, because if we can't see it, we're not engaging it, right? If we can't hear it, we're not, it, we're, we're cut off from that part of God and that part of our humanity. And um, so it's very humbling um, and, and, and a bracing in terms of a call. Uh, so it's... So let's... <laughs> That provides me with a, a good segue. One of the things that we know, uh, Marianne, is that statistics data tells us, for instance, that uh, three quarters of uh, white Americans don't have a single person of color in their uh, intimate social circles, right? right. And that of those that do still uh, only typically one person of color in those social circles. So I always think about this reality of sort of who, not only who we hang out with, but how we raise our kids, how right? It's right. How we raise right. our kids. And you and I often have conversations. We're both mothers. We're both mothers of sons. You have two. I have one. And as mothers do, you and I often find ourselves talking about our sons. You also have a grandson now. And our sons, I think your youngest son, Amos, is uh, just a couple of years older than my young, my son, Desmond. So our sons in so many ways um, are alike. Uh, uh, and you and I often have these conversations, not simply about our sons, but the conversations we have with them. And yeah. I will never forget for instance, one conversation you and I had right after uh, Philandro Castile was murdered. Mm -hmm. And you and I spoke immediately after that. And I remember saying to you that, yes, the first thing I did when I heard of Philandro's uh, murder was that I texted my son. Mm -hmm. And I reminded him of the uh, instructions that we always give him for how to deal with the police. And I simply texted, you know, Des, hands on, steering wheel, do nothing, say nothing, 
If they ask you for your ID, tell them that you're getting it as you move your hands. And I remember, and I shared that with you and you said, wow, I never thought to call my son as soon as I heard that. I also remember the first conversation or the conversation that led to you and I, along with uh, Dean of uh, Washington National Cathedral, uh, Dean Hollerth, putting out the have you no decency statement was you and I began with a conversation about our sons and the fact that my son was in Baltimore and, and right. I felt been compelled uh, right. to say something because he was now put in danger. I've often wondered what in the world, I know the conversations I've had with my son. Right. I've often wondered what are the conversations that white parents are having with their children. So, you know, Mary, just speak to that. Um, as, as I said to you, um, because of white privilege, I've never had to tell my sons to be, a, to um, have as strict a protocol when encountering police, never. And it would never have occurred to me in all their years growing up. And so they were raised uh, without any personal experience of that kind of possibility. Um, they were raised in Minneapolis, as you know. Minneapolis is a very racially segregated city and we lived in one of the widest areas of the community where I served the church. Um, and so they were raised in a very protected environment. Um, both of them chose on their own to go to public schools uh, for high school. We sent them to Catholic schools for elementary school. And um, um, they experienced in high school their own awakening of, of because the high school um, brought in kids from all over, but the school was segregated, right? So they, they, they sort of, they had to navigate. So I didn't parent them in their early years in a way that gave them racial consciousness. They had moral consciousness and we we um they had lots of consciousness about money and about how to treat women but we failed them um on on this issue and uh what they've done with me is i mean i'm so i i they are magnificent young men and they have on their own and in their own lives um worked really hard to understand what it means to be white men in this society and they have made and they've been my teachers in a lot of opportunities in fact our younger son our younger son is actually patrick amos is our older one and patrick was the first one in our family um, when we lived in minneapolis to have true true friends across the racial divide african-american and white because he played football and so if he wanted to play football, he had to go to the other parks, which were um, much more diverse racially. And so he was just surrounded by all these kids and families and we got to know them as a result of it. And I thought they, he was helping me broaden my horizon um, in terms of friends, right? So I just wanna confess that, that that was not part of our world. Uh, being raised in re raising them in Minneapolis, and so um, most of my multicultural, multiracial world was in Central America and in on the migrant issues that I, I dedicated so much of my life to. And so when I came to Washington, my whole world just exploded with contextual relationships and possibilities. And I pray that I'm a better priest for it. I pray I'm a better friend. Um, and also a more responsible Christian leader. But um, so now we're having conversations. This week, my sons both wanted to talk about our privilege and they wanted to know, they wanted to know everything. They wanted to know um, how much money their dad earned. They wanted to know when they were being raised. They wanted to know what inheritance we had. And I was like, yeah, yeah, we don't have any inheritance, but you'll get some, right? But it was just this very like, tell us, we need. And I thought about it because we were in a conversation with a mutual colleague, Don Edwards, who reminded us that in, in those years, 20s to 30s, or when most people decide how much they are personally going to accommodate white supremacy, right? Do you remember that? And, right. um, and I feel like when I was in my 20s, I had very different choices. But when I became a parent, and when I became a priest, and I was called to be a rector, 
I allowed myself to be comfortable in a white supremacist world. Um, and I raised my family in that. And now that it's kind of coming around full circle and I'm realizing, okay, well, I've, I've got some work to do and some showing up to do. And my kids are teaching me things that um, I didn't teach them. So. Now I'm, um, yeah, to hear all of that, but thank you for asking. No, I th thank you for that because what, and you and I have these conversations, hard conversations sometimes, yeah. And, and what you are also saying here is that it's not only the hard conversations that you have to have with each other, we have with each other, but that you have to have with yourself. Yeah. Right. And yeah. you're talking about the hard conversation with yourself and the letting go of, as I often say, you know, sort of that kenosis of letting go of whiteness, letting go of white privilege, and that it's not, we don't have an option to not recognize it. And I'm struck with how you so honestly talk about how your son teaching you, right? And as as my son teaches me, I'm also struck that as you and your son are having these conversations or sons this week about white privilege and uh, inheritance and all of that, I was having ongoing conversations this week with my son almost every day that always began in some way, shape or form with him every day. How long, when is this going to end? Yeah. Uh, to what do you see the end to be? Uh, uh, and so just the very different kind of conversations uh, that we have to have. And so, and you and I have envisioned a time when our sons would have conversations uh, with, with one another. And so- oh, And, and, and um, I think your son is a, is a writer, is that right? It, my son I, is a photographer. Photographer, and, and, right, yeah. right. And, and my, one, my son, Patrick, is a musician. And I think in the arts community too, there's just okay. this, tremendous creative intersectionality that right. and also poverty right i mean there's just not <laughs> right. lots of money well, the first so conversation you and i had when my son decided right. to be an artist was like, make sure he has insurance you know it's like right it's just that um but the but the rawness of it and um i have to say though that i i grieve um I grieve, and yet I also know that it's necessary. the The sense of um, um, it's like when you when you have that sense of the scales being lifted from your eyes, there is this reckoning, right? Yeah. There's reckoning, and um, and then a call to say, "Okay, here you are. Here I am. Use this, Lord. Use oh. me. You. How can I? How, what? What is? What is the call?" Um, and and to um, and to really lean into that, and that's I think that's what we're all trying to discern now is like we show up in the moment that's surged, but then then what's the next? What's the work coming out of this? Um, so right, to we are out of time, and you and I could go on forever. And I know that uh, for us. Uh, this is only the beginning of our conversation and a part of our continued work together yes. and uh, trying to even model what that looks like uh, as we do this journey uh, together in the hard work. I want to leave you with sort of the last word, mm -hmm. uh, Marianne, and that is what, what is it that you want us to hear that we ought to hear as church, as uh, faith leaders, and as just faithful people committed uh, to, as I often say, moving toward the just future that God has promised us all. What, what do you want to leave us with? I would leave, I think I leave us all with um, a, a a word of conviction that this is not of us alone, but that there is a greater spirit that we're all tapping into um, and a greater love that is aching to be manifest in deeper ways. And one of the ways I experience that is that sometimes that spirit or that love takes a hold of me and flings me out into the world. And in that moment, I am so much more 
than I ever am on my own, right? And then it sort of sets me down and then I'm my, my ordinary self again, right? <laughs> right? Like, oh yeah, that, that, that's over. But what that, so there's a humility that comes with it too. Like this, it's not entirely in our hands, but it's also in our hands, right? So it's that divine human partnership that runs through our sacred traditions from beginning to end. Um, but to trust that in this moment, it's not all about, it's up to us, but it's not only about us. And that therefore, when bits of inspiration or guidance come to trust that that might be uh, of the spirit. And Kelly, I would say more, more times than once when you've called me up and you've said, Marion, we've got to do something. I have felt that as a nudge from, not just from my friend Kelly, but from the spirit saying, okay, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Time to get to work. And so that, that's who we are for each other. And that's uh, right. And you know, and 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 here's what I say on those times that I have called you and said, okay, Marianne, we got to do something. One, you always say yes, even when I don't even know what it is I'm calling. <laughs> we have to figure it out, right? We're figuring we figure it out. it out together. And 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 with the grace and and, and of God. And we discern that. And so I want to thank you yeah. so much for all of the times that you show up and you have shown up and you've allowed us during these couple of weeks to show up as a church. And what I appreciate most is you revealing to all of us the very humanity of who we are. And so it doesn't matter if we make mistakes it only matters that we show up and that if we fail, we fail forward and yeah. continue to progress. So thank you, thank Bishop you. Marianne Buddy for being our Bishop, for being my Bishop, for being my friend, and for most of all, listening to the call of God for us to do better and to be better. Thank you. And thank you all for joining me in this conversation. And I invite you to another of our Facebook Live conversations coming up on Friday with Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow. Thank you. Bye-bye.